Part 6 Chapter 23 The pressure of tiny feet kneading on my stomach woke me from my reveries. As if only a moment had passed, the memories of the bygone days, weeks, and months had drifted through my mind in vivid detail. Words of protest died on my lips as Tutami lowered Hoashiwe on top of me. I cradled the baby in my arms, lest he awaken little Tishoma, who had fallen asleep in my hammock while waiting for me to get up. I reached for Hoashiwe's frog skulls threaded on a layana string hanging at the head of my hammock and rattled them in front of him. Gurgling with delight, the baby tried to reach them. Are you awake? Tishoma mumbled, touching my cheek lightly. I thought you were going to sleep the whole day. I've been thinking about all I've seen and learned since I first came here, I said, taking her small hand in mine. The narrow palm, the long, delicately shaped fingers were oddly mature for a five-year-old child and contrasted sharply with her dimpled face. I didn't realize the sun's already up. You didn't even notice my brother and cousins leaving your hammock as soon as the plantains were baked, Tishoma said. Were you thinking very hard? No, I laughed. It was more like dreaming. It seems as if no time has passed since the day I arrived at the Shabono. To me, it's like a long time, Tishoma said seriously, caressing her half-brother's soft hair. When you first arrived, this tiny baby was still sleeping inside Tutami's belly. I remember well the day my mothers found you. Giggling, the little girl buried her face in my neck. I know why you wept that day. You were afraid of my great uncle, Ira Mamoe. He has an ugly face. That day, I whispered, conspiringly, I was afraid of all the Itikoteri. Feeling a warm wetness on my stomach, I held Hoashiwe away from me. Itiwe, sitting astride his hammock, smiled in amusement as he watched the arc of his son's urine spanning over the fire. <clears throat> of all of us, Tishoma asked, even of my father and grandfather, even of my mother's and old Hayama. Bending over my face, she gazed at me with an expression of incredulity, almost of anguish, as if she were searching for something in my eyes. Were you also afraid of me? No, I wasn't afraid of you, <clears throat> I assured her, bouncing the laughing Hoashiwe on my thighs. I wasn't afraid of you either. Sighing with relief, Tishoma lay back in the hammock. I didn't hide like most of the children did when you first walked into our hut. We had heard that whites were tall and hairy like monkeys. But you looked so little. I knew you couldn't be a real white. As soon as her basket was securely fastened to her back, Tutami lifted her baby from my lap. Expertly, she placed him in the wide, softened bark sling she wore across her chest. Ready? She said, smiling, then looked questioningly at Itiwe and Ritime. Grinning, Itiwe picked up his machete and his bow and arrows. Will you come later? Ritime asked me as she adjusted the long, slender rod stuck through the septum of her nose. The corners of her mouth, free of the usual smooth sticks, turned up in a smile, dimpling her cheeks. As if sensing my indecision, Ritime did not wait for my reply, but followed her husband and Tutami to the gardens. Hayama is coming, Tutami whispered. She is wondering why you haven't come to eat, her baked plantain. The little girl slid from the hammock and ran toward a group of children playing outside. Muttering, 
Hayama walked through to Tami's hut. Her loose skin hung in long vertical wrinkles down her thighs and belly. Her face was set in a stern mane as she handed me a half gourd filled with plantain mush. Sighing, she sat in Ritimi's hammock, letting her hand trail along the ground as she rocked herself to and fro, apparently entranced by the rhythmic squeaking of the liana knot against the pole. It's too bad I've not been able to fatten you up, the old woman said after a long silence. I assured her that her plantains had worked wonders, that given a bit more time, I might even become fat. There isn't much time, Hayama said softly. You are leaving for the mission. What? I cried, struck by the definiteness of her tone. Who says so? Before he left, Milagros made Arasue promise that if we were to move to one of our old gardens deeper in the forest, we were not to take you. The nostalgic, almost dreamy gaze of her eyes softened Hayama's expression as she reminded me of the various families who several weeks before had left for the old gardens. Believing they were to return soon, I had not paid much attention to their desperate to their departure at the time. Hayama went on to explain that Arasue's household, as well as those of his brothers, cousins, sons, and daughters, had not yet followed the others for the simple reason that the head man was waiting to hear from Milagros. Is the Shibono going to be abandoned? I asked. What about the gardens here? They were only recently expanded. What will happen to all the new plantain shoots? I said excitedly. They will grow. Hayama's face crinkled with cheerful amusement. The old people and many of the children will remain here. We will build temporary shelters close to the plantain patches, for no one likes to live in a solitary shabono. We will take care of the gardens until the others return. By then, the bananas and rasha fruit will be ripe, and once again, it will be time to feast. But why are so many Itikoteri leaving? I asked. Isn't there enough food here? Hayama did not actually say that there was a food shortage. She stressed the fact that old gardens, which have not been visited for a long time, become a feeding ground for monkeys, birds, aguti, picari, and tapir. Men have an easy time hunting, and the women still find plenty of roots and fruits in such gardens to last until the game has been exhausted. Besides, Hayama went on, a temporary move is always good, especially after a raid. If I weren't too old, I would also go. Like a holiday, I said. Yes, a holiday, Hayama laughed once I explained what was meant by the word. Oh, how much I'd like to go and sit in the shade, stuffing myself with kafu fruit. Kafu trees were prized for their bark and bast fibers. The clusters of fruit each about 10 inches long, hang on a common stalk. The gelatinous, fleshy fruit is filled with tiny seeds and tastes like an overripe, fresh fig. If I can't move with Arasue and his family to the old gardens, I said, squatting at the head of Hayama's hammock, then I will stay here with you. There is no reason for me to return to the mission, We'll await the return of the others together. Hayama's eyes shone with an unnatural brightness as they rested on my face. In a slow, deliberate tone, she made it clear that, although it was not customary to raid an empty shibono or to kill old people and children, 
The Mokototeri would undoubtedly, undoubtedly make trouble if they were to learn, which the old woman assured me they would, that I had been left behind in an unprotected settlement. I shuddered, remembering how several weeks before, a group of Mokototeri men armed with clubs had arrived at the Shabono, demanding the return of their women. After both groups had shouted threats and insults at each other, Arasue told the Mokoto Terry that he had purposely freed one of the abducted women on his way home. He stressed the fact that not for an instant had he been taken in by the woman's trick of having been bitten by a snake. However, after more bickering on both sides, the head man reluctantly handed over the girl old Hayama had chosen as a second wife for her youngest son. Threatening to retaliate at a later date, the Mokoto Terry left. It was the Tuwe who had explained to me that although the Mokoto Terry had had no intention of starting a shooting war, they had left their bows and arrows hidden in the forest. The head man had acted wisely in returning the girl so promptly. The Itikoteri were outnumbered, as several men had already left for the abandoned gardens. When will Arasue join the others in the old gardens? I asked Hayama. Very soon, she said. Arasue has sent several men to find Milagros. Unfortunately, they have been unable to get in touch with him so far. I smiled to myself. It seems that regardless of what Arasue promised, I'll end up going with Ritime and Etue, I said smugly. You won't, Hayama assured me, then grinned maliciously. It's not only from the Mokoto Terry we have to protect you, but a Shapori might abduct you on the way to the gardens and keep you as his woman in a faraway hut. I doubt it, I said giggling. You told me once that no man would want me this skinny. I told the old woman about the incident in the mountains with Etue. Pressing her folded arms across her hanging bosom, Hayama laughed until tears rolled down her wrinkled cheeks. Etue would take any woman that's available, she said, but he's afraid of you. Hayama leaned over her hammock, then whispered, A Shapori is an, an ordinary man. He wouldn't want you for his pleasure. A Shapori needs the femaleness in his body. She lay back in the hammock. Do you know where that femaleness is? No. The old woman looked at me as if she thought I was slow-witted. In the vagina, she finally said, almost choking on her laughter. Do you think that Puri Wariwe might abduct me? I asked mockingly. I'm sure that he's too old to care about women. Genuine amazement widened her eyes. Haven't you seen? Hasn't anyone told you that that old Shapori is stronger than any man in the Shabono? She asked. There are nights when that old man goes from hut to hut, sticking his cock inside every woman he can find. And he doesn't get tired. At dawn, when he returns to the forest, he's as ready as ever. Hayama assured me that Puri Wawiwe could not possibly abduct me, for he no longer needed anything. She warned me, however, that there were other shamans, less powerful than the old man, who might. Closing her eyes, she sighed loudly. I thought she had fallen asleep, but, as if sensing my motion to get up, the old woman turned to me abruptly. She placed both her hands on my shoulders, then asked me in a voice that shook with emotion, do you know why you like being with us? 
I looked at her uncomprehendedly. And as I opened my mouth to respond, Hayama went on to say, You are happy here because you have no responsibilities. You live like us. You have learned to speak quite well and know many of our customs. To us, you are neither child or adult, man or woman. We make no demands on you. If we did, you would resent it. Hayama's eyes were so dark as they held my gaze. They made me uncomfortable. In her wrinkled face, they seemed too large and bright, as if glowing with an inexhaustible inner energy. After a long pause, she added provokingly, Were you to become a woman shapori, you would be very unhappy. I felt threatened. Yet, as I stammered inanities to defend myself, I suddenly realized that she was right, and I was seized by a desperate desire to laugh. Gently, the old woman pressed her fingers over my lips. There are powerful shapori living in remote places where the hakuras of animals and plants dwell, Hayama said. In the dark of night, those men consort with beautiful female spirits. I'm glad I'm not a beautiful spirit, I said. No, you are not beautiful. Hayama, with her cajoling laugh and mocking gaze, made it impossible for me to take offense at her uncomplimentary remark. Yet too many of us, yet too many of us, you are strange. There was great tenderness in her voice as she tried to make me understand why the Motkototeri wanted to take me to their Shabono. Their interest in me was not due to the usual reasons Indians befriend whites, to get machetes, cooking pots, and clothes, but because the Mokototeri believed I had powers. They had heard of how I had cured little Tashoma, about the Apina incident, and how Ira Mamowe had seen Hikuras reflected in my eyes. They had even seen me use a bow and arrow. All my endeavors to make the old woman realize that it required no special powers, only common sense, to help a child with a cold, were in vain. I argued that even she herself can be considered to have healing powers. She set bones and smeared secret concoctions made from animal parts, roots and leaves on bites, scratches and cuts but my reasonings were futile. To her, there was a vast difference between setting a bone and coaxing the lost soul of a child back into its body. That, she stressed, only a shapori could do. But Iramamoe brought her soul back, I asserted. I only cured her cold. He didn't, Hayama insisted. He heard you chant. That was a prayer, I said feebly, realizing that a prayer was in no way different from Ira Mamoe's Hakura chants. I know whites are not like us, Hayama interrupted me, determined to prevent me from arguing further. I'm talking about something different altogether. Had you been born an Itikoteri, you would still be different from Ritime, Tutemi, or me. Hayama touched my face, running her long, bony fingers over my forehead and cheeks. My sister Angelica would never have asked you to accompany her into the forest. Milagros would never have brought you to stay with us if you were like the whites he knows. She regarded me thoughtfully. Then, as if struck with an afterthought, added, I wonder if any other whites would have been as happy as you have been with us. 
I'm sure they would have, I said softly. There aren't many whites who have a chance to come here. Ayama shrugged her shoulders. Do you remember the story about Ima Wa Ami, the woman Shapori? She asked. That's a myth. Afraid that the old woman was trying to make some connection between Ima Awami and myself, I hastily added. It's like the story of the bird who stole the first fire from the alligator's mouth. Maybe, Ayama said dreamily. Lately, I have been thinking about the stories my father, grandfather, and even my great-grandfather used to tell about the white men they had seen traveling along the big rivers. There must have been whites journeying through the forest long before my great-grandfather's time. Perhaps Ima Awami was one of them. Hayami, Hayama moved her eager face close to mine, then continued in a whisper. It must have been a Shapori who captured her, believing the white woman was a beautiful spirit. But she was more powerful than the Shapori. She stole his Hakuras and became a sorceress herself. Hayama looked at me provokingly, as if daring me to contradict her. I was not surprised by the old woman's reasoning. The Itikoteri were in the habit of bringing their mythology up to date, or of incorporating facts into their myths. Do Indian women ever become Shapori? I asked. Yes, Hayama said promptly. Female Shapori are strange creatures. Like men, they hunt with bows and arrows. They decorate their bodies with the spots and broken circles of a jaguar. They take a pina and lure the hakuras into their chests with their songs. Women Shapori have husbands who serve them. But if they have children, they once again become ordinary women. Angelica was a Shapori, wasn't she? I was unaware. I had thought out loud. The thought came with the uncertainty of a revelation. I recalled the time Angelica had awakened me from a nightmare at the mission the way her incomprehensible song had soothed me. It had not resembled the melodious song of the Itikoteri women, but the monotonous chant of the shamans. Like them, Angelica seemed to possess two voices, one that originated from somewhere deep inside her, the other from her throat. I remember the days of walking with Milagros and Angelica through the forest and how Angelica's remarks about the spirits of the forest lurking in the shadows that I should always dance with them but never let them become a burden had enchanted me. I clearly visualized how Angelica had danced that morning. Her arms raised above her head, her feet moving with quick, jerky steps in the same manner that the Itikoteri men danced when in an Apina trance. Until now, I had never thought in the least odd that Angelica, as opposed to the other Indian women at the mission, had considered it very natural for me to have come to hunt in the jungle. Hayama's words awoke me from my musings. Did my sister tell you she was a Shapori? A profound grief filled Hayama's eyes. Tears gathered at their corners. The drops never rolled down her cheeks but lost themselves in a network of wrinkles. She never told me, I murmured, then lay down in my hammock. With one leg on the ground, I pushed myself back and forth adjusting the rhythm of my hammock to Hayama's so that the vine knots 
would squeak in unison. My sister was the Shapori, Hayama said after a long silence. I don't know what happened to her after she left our Shabono. While she was with us, she was a respected Shapori, but she lost her powers when she had Milagros. Hayama sat up abruptly. His father was a white man. Afraid that my curiosity might escape through my eyes, I closed them. I did not dare breathe, lest the smallest sound put an end to the old woman's reveries. There was no way of learning which country Milagro's father had come from. Regardless of their origins, any non-Indian was considered a nape. Milagro's father was a white man, Hayama repeated. A long time ago, when we lived closer to the big river, a nape came to stay at our settlement. Angelica believed she could get his power. Instead, she got pregnant. Why didn't she abort? A broad grin, a broad grin crossed Hayama's lined face. Perhaps Angelica was too confident, the old woman murmured. Maybe she believed she could still be a Shapori after having a child by a white man. Hayama's mouth opened wide with laughter, revealing yellowish teeth. There is nothing white about Milagros, she said mischievously. Even though my sister took him away, in spite of all he learned from the white man, Milagros will always be an Itikoteri. Hayama's eyes shone with a strong, unwavering stare, and her face revealed a certain indefinable, pent-up triumph. The thought that I would soon be returning to the mission filled me with apprehension. On several occasions since my illness, I had tried to imagine what it would be like to return to Caracas or to Los Angeles. How would I react to seeing relatives and friends? During those moments, I had known I would never leave of my own accord. When will Milagros take me back to the mission? I asked. I don't think Arasue will wait for Milagros. The head man can no longer postpone his departure, Hayama said. Iramamoe will take you back. Iramamoe, I exclaimed in disbelief. Why not Etiwe? Patiently, Hayama explained that Iramamoe had been near the mission on several occasions. He knew the way better than any of the Itikoteri. There was also the possibility of Etiwe being discovered by Mokototeri hunters, in which case he would be killed and I would be abducted. Iramamoe, on the other hand, Hayama assured me, can make himself invisible in the forest. But I can't, I protested. You will be guarded by Iramamoe's hekuras, Hayama said with utter conviction. Cumbersomely, the old woman stood up, rested for a moment with her hands on her thighs then took my arm and slowly walked me over to her own hut. Iramamoe has protected you before, Hayama re reminded me, then eased herself into her hammock. Yes, I agreed. But I can't go to the mission without Milagros. I need sardines and crackers. That stuff will only make you sick, she said contemptuously. Hayama assured me that I would not suffer from hunger on the way, for Iramamoe's arrows would hit plenty of game. Besides, she would give me a basket full of plantains. I'm too weak to carry such a heavy load, I objected. 
knowing that Iramamoe would carry nothing besides his bow and arrows. Ayama regarded me with gentle mockery. She stretched in her hammock, opened her mouth in an interminable yawn, and promptly fell asleep. I walked into the clearing. A group of children, mostly little girls, were playing with a puppy. Each girl tried to make the animal suck from her flat nipples. Except for a few old people resting in their hammocks and several menstruating women crouching near the hearths, most of the huts were deserted. I went from dwelling to dwelling, wondering if they knew I was soon to leave. An old man offered me his tobacco wad. Smiling, I declined. How can anyone refuse such a treat? His eyes seemed to say as he reinserted the wad between his lower lip and gum. Late in the afternoon, I walked into Iramamoe's hut. His oldest wife, who had just returned from the river, was hanging two water-filled gourds on the rafters. We had become good friends since the time her son, Shoroi, had been initiated as a shapori and had spent many afternoons talking about him. Occasionally, Shoroi, Shoroi returned to the Shabono to cure people afflicted with colds, fevers, and diarrhea. He chanted to the Hikuras with the same zeal and strength as the more experienced shamans did. Yet, according to Puriwariwe, it would still be some time before Shoroi could send his own spirits to cause harm among an enemy settlement. Only then would he be accepted as a full-fledged sorcerer. Iramamoe's wife poured some water into a small calabash, then added some honey. Greedily, I watched the runny paste, studded with bees in the various stages of their metamorphic process. After stirring it thoroughly with her finger, she offered me the gourd. Smacking my lips between each sip, I finished the drink and licked the bottom clean. What a delight! I exclaimed. I'm sure it's from the Omoshi bees. They were a stingless variety and greatly prized for their dark, aromatic honey. Smiling in agreement, Iramamoe's wife motioned me to sit beside her in her hammock. She examined my back for flea and mosquito bites. Discovering two recent ones, she sucked out the poison. The light entering the hut grew dimmer. It seemed that such a long time had passed since I had talked with Hayama that morning. Drowsily, I closed my eyes. I dreamt I was with the children by the river. Thousands of butterflies fluttered out of the trees, swirling through the air-like autumn leaves. They alighted on our hair, faces, and bodies, covering us with a tenuous golden light of dusk. Despondently, I gazed at their wings, like delicate hands weaving farewell. You cannot be sad, the children were saying. I looked into each face and kissed the laughter on their lips. Chapter 24 Instead of the bamboo knife she always used, Ritime trimmed my hair with a sharp grass blade. Frowning with concentration, she made sure the hair was cut evenly all around my head. Not my tonsure, I said, covering the top of my head with my folded hands. It hurts. Don't be so cowardly, Ritime laughed. 
You don't want to arrive at the mission looking like a barbarian. I could not make her understand that among whites, I would be considered an oddity with a bald spot on the top of my head. Ritime insisted that it was not merely for aesthetic reasons, but practical ones as well, that she needed to shave the crown of my head. Lice, she pointed out, liked that particular spot best. I'm certain Ira Mamoe would not delouse you in the evenings. Maybe you should shave my hair completely, I suggested. That's the best way to get rid of them. Horrified, Rutimi stared at me. Only the very sick have their heads shaved. You would look ugly. Nodding in agreement, I submitted to her ministrations. Upon finishing, she rubbed the bald spot with a noto. Then she very carefully painted my face with the red paste. She drew a wide, straight line below my bangs and wavy ones across my cheeks with dots between each of the lines. What a shame I did not pierce your nose and the corners of your mouth when you first arrived, she said disappointedly. Removing the polished, slender stick from her septum, she held it under my nose. How beautiful you would have looked, she sighed with comical resignation, and proceeded to paint my back with wide, onoto lines, rounding toward my buttocks. On the front, starting below my breasts, she drew wavy lines all the way down to my thighs. Lastly, she encircled my ankles with broad red bands. Looking down my legs, I had the feeling I was wearing socks. Tutami tied a newly made cotton belt around my waist, the front fringe resting on my pubis. Pleased at my appearance, she clapped her hands and jumped up and down excitedly. Oh, the ears, she cried motioning Ritimi to hand her the white feather tufts held together on a thin string. Tutami tied them on my earrings. Around my upper arms and below my knees, she fastened red dye cotton strands. Encircling my waist with her arms, Ritimi took me from hut to hut so I could be admired by the Itikoteri. For one last time, I saw myself reflected in the women's shiny eyes and delighted in the men's mocking smiles. Yawning, old Kamosiwe stretched, stretched his skinny arms until they seemed about to be pulled from their sockets. He opened his one eye, studying my face as if he were trying to memorize my features. With slow, deliberate movements, he unfastened the small pouch he wore around his neck and took out the pearl I had given him. Whenever I let this stone roll on my palm, I will think of you. Unwilling to believe that never again would I stand there in the shibono, that never again would I awake to the children's laughter as they climbed into my hammock at dawn, I wept. There were no goodbyes. I simply followed Iramamowe and Etuwe into the forest. Ritimi and Tutemi were behind me, as if we were going to collect firewood. Silently, we walked along the path the whole day, stopping only momentarily to snack. The sun was setting behind the horizon of trees when we came to a halt beneath the dark shadows of three giant sibas. They had grown so close together that they appeared to be one. Ritime fastened the basket she had been carrying for me on my back. It was packed with plantains, roasted monkey meat, a honey-filled calabash, several empty gourds, my hammock, 
and my knapsack, which contained my jeans and a torn shirt. You won't grow sad if you paint your body with a noto each time you bathe in the river, Ritimi said, trying to tying a small gourd around my waist. It had been polished with abrasive leaves, smooth and white. It hung from my cotton belt like a giant teardrop. The forest, the three smiling faces, blurred before me. Without another word, Ritime led the way into the thicket. Only Atiwe turned around before melting into the shadows. A grin lit his face as he waved the way he had so often seen Milagros do when he bid me farewell. I gave free rein to the vast desolation inside me. It did not make me feel any better, but only heightened my despondency. Yet in spite of my wretchedness, I was strangely aware of the three Sibas in front of me. As if in a dream, I recognized the trees. I had been on this very spot before. Milagros had squatted in front of me. Impassively, he had watched the rain wash my face and body of Angelica's ashes. Today, it was Ira Mamowe squatting on the same spot, gazing at the tears rolling uncontrollably down my cheeks. It was here that I first saw Ritime, Tutemi, and Etuwe, I said. Suddenly I realized it had been Ritime's deliberate choice to accompany me this far. I understood all she had left unsaid, how deeply she felt. She had given me back a basket and a gourd, the two items I was carrying that distant day. Only now the gourd was not filled with ashes, but with a noto, a symbol of life and happiness. A quiet loneliness, humble and accepting, filled my heart. I carefully dried my tears so as not to erase the Onoto designs. Perhaps one day Ritimi will find you on this spot again, Ira Mamoe said, his habitually stern face softened by a fleeting smile. Let's walk a bit farther before we rest for the night. Lifting the heavy bunch of plantains from my basket, he flung it over his shoulder. He was slightly swayed back, and his belly stuck out. Iramamoe must have felt the same urge to walk as I did. My feet seemed to move of their own accord, knowing exactly where to step in the darkness. I never lost sight of Iramamoe's arrow quiver immobilized under the load of plantains. Moving through the darkness, I had the illusion that it was not I, but the forest that was leaving. We'll sleep here, Iramamoe said, inspecting the weathered lean to that stood away from the path. He built a small fire inside, then hung his hammock next to mine. I lay awake, watching the stars and the faint moon through the opening of the hut. Mist thickened the darkness until there was no light left. Trees and sky formed one mass through which I imagined bows falling from the clouds like heavy rain and Hikuras rising from invisible crevices in the earth. They danced to the sound of a shaman's song. The sun was high over the treetops when Iramamoe woke me. After finishing a baked plantain and a piece of monkey meat, 
I offered him my calabash with honey. You'll need it for the days of walking, he said. A friendly glance softened his words of refusal. We will find more on the way, he promised, reaching for his machete and his bow and arrows. We walked at a steady pace, much faster than I remember ever having walked in my life. We crossed rivers, we moved up and down hills that bore no familiar landmark. Days spent walking, nights spent sleeping, chased each other with predictable swiftness. My thoughts did not reach beyond each day or night. There was nothing between them but a short-lived dawn and dusk during which we ate. I know this place, I exclaimed one afternoon, breaking the long silence. I pointed to the dark rocks jutting from the earth. They formed a perpendicular wall along the river's edge. But the longer I gazed at the river and trees, already purple in the twilight, the less sure I felt I had been there before. I climbed over a tree trunk that extended all the way into the water. The day had been deadly still, but now the leaves began to stir gently, sending forth a fresh whisper along the river. Arching branches and creepers brushed the water surface, burying themselves in the dark liquid that harbored no fish and discouraged mosquitoes. Are we close to the mission? I asked, turning to Iramamowe. He did not answer. After a moment, as if annoyed by the silence he was unwilling to break, he motioned me to follow. I felt tired. Each step was an effort, yet I could not remember having gone very far that day. I lifted my head as I heard the cry of a bird. A yellow leaf, like a giant butterfly, fluttered from a branch. As if afraid to fall and rot on the ground, the leaf clung to my thigh. Iramamoe held out his hand behind him, gesturing me to remain still. Stealthily, he stalked along the river bank. We will eat meat tonight, he whispered, then disappeared in the uncertain light, his body but a line against the shimmering river's surface. Lying down on the dark sand, I watched the sky ablaze for a moment as the earth swallowed the sun. I drank the last of the honey Iramamoe had found that morning, then fell asleep with its sweetness on my lips. Awakened by the sound of crackling flames, I turned on my stomach. On a small platform built over the fire, Iramamoe was roasting an almost two-foot-long agouti. It's not good to sleep at night without the protection of a fire, he said facing me. The spirits of the forest might bewitch you. I'm so tired, I yawned, moving closer to the fire. I could sleep for days. It will rain during the night, Hiramamoe announced, as he planted the three poles that would make our shelter around the roasting meat. I helped him cover the roof and sides with the wild banana fronds he had cut while I slept. He fastened the hammocks close to the fire so we could push the logs to the flames without having to get up. The guti tasted like roast pork, tender and juicy. What we did not finish, Iramamoe tied to a stick high above the fire. We'll eat the rest in the morning. Grinning, as if pleased with himself, 
he stretched fully in his hammock. It will give us strength to climb the mountains. Mountains? I asked. I only went over hills when I came with Angelica and Milagros. I bent over Iramamoe. The only time I climbed up a mountain was when I returned to the Shabono with Ritime and Etue from the Mokoto Terry Feast. Those mountains were close to the Shabono. I touched his face. Are you sure you know the way to the mission? What a question to ask, he said, closing his eyes and crossing his arms over his chest. His bristly eyebrows slanted toward his temples. There were a few hairs at the edge of his upper lip. The skin over his high cheekbones was stretched taut. Only a faint trace of the Anoto designs, still recognizable. As if annoyed by my scrutiny, he opened his eyes. They reflected the light of the fire. But his gaze revealed nothing. I lay down in my hammock. I ran my fingers along my forehead and cheeks wondering if the Onoto lines and dots had also faded on my face. Tomorrow I'll bathe in the river, I thought. And my uneasiness, which is probably nothing but exhaustion, will vanish as soon as I paint myself anew with Onoto. Yet, no matter how I tried to reassure myself, I was unable to still my mounting distrust. My body and mind were tight with a vague premonition I could not put into words. The air became chilly. Leaning over, I pushed one of the logs closer to the flames. It will be even colder in the mountains, Yuramamoe mumbled. I will make us a drink from plants that will keep us warm. Reassured by his words, I began to inhale and exhale with exaggerated depth, deliberately pushing all thoughts away until I was unaware of nothing but the sound of the rain, the smoke-warmed air, the smell of damp earth. And I slept a calm, untroubled sleep that lasted throughout the night. In the morning, we bathed in the river, then painted each other's faces and bodies with a noto. Iramamoe was specific about the designs he desired. A serpentine line across his forehead, extending down to his jaws, then around his mouth. A circle between his brow, at the corners of his eyes, and two on each cheek. On his chest, he wanted wavy lines, running all the way to his navel. And on his back, the lines had to be straight. A smile of gentle mockery softened his face as he covered me from head to foot with uniform circles. What do they mean? I asked eagerly. Ritimi had never decorated me thus. Nothing! He said, laughing. This way you don't look so skinny. At first, the ascent up the narrow trail was easy. The undergrowth was free of serrated grasses and thorny weeds. A warm mist enshrouded the forest, creating a diaphanous light through which the crowns of the tall palm trees seemed to hang suspended from the sky. The sound of waterfalls echoed eerily through the misty air. And each time I brushed against a branch or leaf, tiny drops of moisture clung to me. The afternoon rain, however, turned the path into a muddy menace. I bruised my toes repeatedly on the roots and stones beneath the slippery surface. We made camp late in the afternoon halfway up the summit. Exhausted, 
I sat on the ground and watched Iramamoe pound three strong poles into the earth. I did not have the strength to help him cover the triangular structure with palm fronds and giant leaves. Are you coming back this way on your return to the Shibono? I asked, wondering why he was reinforcing the hut so well. It appeared altogether too sturdy for a one-night shelter. Iramamome gave me a sidelong glance, but did not answer. Is there going to be a storm tonight? I asked in an exasperated tone. An irrepressible smile played around his lips, and his face looked uncannily childish as he squatted beside me. A mischievous sparkle, as if he were planning some prank, shone in his eyes. Tonight you will sleep well, he finally said, then proceeded to build a fire inside the cozy hut. He fastened my hammock in the back. His own, he hung close to the narrow entrance. Tonight, we will not feel the cold air, he said, looking for the gourd in which were soaking the shredded leaves and pale yellow flowers of a plant he had found the previous day, growing over some rocks in a sunny spot along the river's edge. He unsealed the calabash, added more water, then placed it over the fire. Softly he began to chant, his eyes fixed on the dark simmering liquid. Trying to figure out the words of his song, I fell asleep. I was awakened shortly by him. Drink this, he urged, holding the gourd close to my lips. It has been cooled by the mountain dew. I took a sip. It tasted like herb tea. Bitter, but not unpleasantly so. After a few more gulps, I pushed the calabash toward him. Drink it all, Hiramamoe said coaxingly. It will keep you warm. You will sleep for days. Days? I emptied the gourd smiling at his remarks as if it were a joke. A faint touch of malice seemed to be lurking somewhere within him. By the time it fully dawned on me that he was not being facetious, a pleasant numbness seeped through my body, melting my anxiety into a comforting heaviness that made my head feel as if it were lead. I was sure it would break off my neck. The image of my head rolling on the ground, a ball with two glass eyes, threw me into spasms of laughter. Crouching by the fire, Ira Mamoe watched me with growing curiosity. Slowly I stood up. I've lost my physicality, I thought had no control over my legs as I tried to place one foot in front of the other. Dejected, I slumped on the ground next to Iramamoe. Why don't you laugh? I asked, surprised at my own words. What I really wanted to know was if the sound of drops prattling on the thatched roof was a storm. I wondered if I had actually spoken for the words kept reverberating in my head like a distant echo. Afraid to miss his answer, I moved closer to him. Iramamoe's face became taut as the cry of a nocturnal monkey broke the night stillness. His nostrils flared, his full lips set in a straight line, his eyes piercing into mine grew larger, shining with a deep loneliness, a gentleness that contrasted oddly with his severe, mask-like face. As if I were animated by a slow-motion mechanism, I crawled to the edge of the hut, 
each of my movements a gigantic effort. I felt as if all my tendons had been replaced with elastic strings. I relished the sensation of being able to stretch in any direction into the most absurd postures I could imagine. From the pouch hanging around his neck, Ira Mamoe poured a pina into his palm. He drew the hallucinogenic powder deep into his nostrils, then began chanting. I felt his song inside me, surrounding me, drawing me toward him. Without any hesitation, I drank from the gourd he once again held to my lips. The dark liquid no longer tasted bitter. My sense of time and distance became distorted. Iramamoe and the fire were so far away. I feared I had lost them across the wide expanse of the hut. Yet the next instant, his eyes were so close to mine, I saw myself reflected in the dark pupils. I was crushed by the weight of his body and my arms folded beneath his chest. He whispered words into my ears that I could not hear. A breeze parted the leaves, revealing the shadowy night, the treetops brushing the stars, countless stars, massed together as if in readiness to fall. I reached out, my hand grasped leaves adorned with diamond drops. For an instant, they clung to my fingers, then disintegrated like dew. Iramamoe's heavy body held me. His eyes sowed seeds of light inside me. His gentle voice urged me to follow him through dreams of day and night. Dreams of rainwater and bitter leaves. There was nothing violent about his body imprisoning mine. Waves of pleasure mingled with visions of mountains and rivers, faraway places where Hekuras dwell. I danced with the spirits of animals and trees, gliding with them through mist, through roots and trunks, through branches and leaves. I sang with the voices of birds and spiders, jaguars and snakes. I shared the dreams of all those who feed on a pina, on bitter flowers and leaves. I no longer knew if I was awake or dreaming. At moments I vaguely remembered old Hayama's words about shamans needing the femaleness in their bodies. But those memories were neither clear nor lasting. They remained dim unexamined premonitions. Iramamoe always knew whenever I was about to fall into real sleep, whenever my tongue was ready to ask, whenever I was about to weep. If you can't dream, I'll make you, he said, taking me in his arms and rubbing away my tears against his cheek and my desire to refuse the gourd sitting by the fire like a forest spirit vanished. Greedily, I drank the dark bearer of visions until once again I was suspended in a timelessness that was neither day or night. I was one with the rhythm of Iramamoe's breath, with the beat of his heart, as I merged with the light and the darkness inside him. A time came when I felt I was moving through an undergrowth of trees, leaves, and motionless vines. I knew I was not walking, yet I was descending from the cold forest, sunk in mist. My feet were tied, and my upside-down head shook as though it were being emptied. 
Visions flowed from my ears, nostrils, and mouth, leaving a faint line on the steep path. And for one last instant, I glimpsed Shabonos inhabited by men and women shamans of another time. When I awoke, Iramamoe was crouched by the fire, his face alight with the flames and a faint streak of moon shining into the hut. I wondered how many days had elapsed since the night he had first offered me the bitter-tasting brew. There was no gourd by the fire. I was certain we were no longer in the mountains. The night was clear, the soft breeze stirring the treetops disentangled my thoughts, and I drifted into a dreamless sleep as I listened to the monotonous sound of Iramamoe's Hikura songs. The persistent growling of my stomach awoke me. I felt dizzy as I stood on uncertain legs in the empty hut. My body was painted with wavy lines. How strange it had all been, I thought. I felt no regret. I was not filled with hate or repulsion. It was not that I was numbed emotionally. Rather, I felt the same indescribable sensation I experienced upon awakening from a dream that I could not quite explain. Near the fire lay a bundle containing roasted frogs. I sat on the ground and gnawed on the tiny bones until they were clean. Iramamoe's machete, reclining against one of the poles, reassured me that he was somewhere close by. Following the sound of the river, I walked through the tangled growth, startled to see Iramamoe beaching a small canoe only a short distance away. I hid behind some bushes. I recognized the craft as being one made by the Makwiri Tare Indians. I had seen that kind made from a hollowed tree trunk at the mission. The thought that we might be close to one of their settlements, or perhaps even to the mission, made my heart beat faster. Iramamoe gave me no indication of having heard or seen me approach. Furtively, I returned to the shelter, wondering how he came into possession of the canoe. Moments later, with a vine rope and a large bundle slung over his back, Iramamoe walked into the hut. Fish, he said, dropping the rope and bundle on the ground. I blushed, and embarrassed at my blushing, laughed. Unhurriedly, he balanced the wrapped fish between the logs, making sure enough heat, but no direct flames, reached the platanilo leaves. Totally engrossed in the sound of the simmering fish, he remained squatting by the fire. As soon as all the juices were cooked away, he removed the bundle from the logs with a forked stick and opened it. It's good, he said, scooping a handful of white, flaky meat into his mouth, then pushed the bundle toward me. What happened in the mountains? I asked. Startled by my belligerent tone, his mouth gaped open. A piece of unchewed fish fell into the ashes. Automatically, without checking the dirt sticking to it, he put the morsel back into his mouth, then reached for the liana rope on the ground. An irrational fear seized me. I was convinced that Iramamoe was going to tie me up and carry me farther into the forest. I was no longer aware that only a short while before, I had been certain we were near 
a Maquiritare settlement, or even the mission. All I could think of was old Hayama's story about shamans who kept captive women hidden in faraway places. I was convinced Iramamoe would never take me back to the mission. The thought that he had wanted to keep me hidden in the forest. The thought that had he wanted to keep me hidden in the forest, he would not have brought me down from the mountain did not cross my mind at the moment. I did not trust his smile, nor the gentle glint in his eyes. I picked up the water-filled gourd standing by the fire and offered it to him. Smiling, he dropped the rope. I moved closer, as if I intended to bring the calabash to his lips. Instead, I smashed it between his eyes with all my strength. Caught totally unaware, he fell backwards, staring at me in dumb incredulity as the blood ran down on both sides of his nose. Heedless of thorns, roots, and the sharp grass, I sped through the thicket toward the place where I had seen the canoe. But I miscalculated where Iramamoe had anchored it. For when I reached the river, there was nothing but stones strewn along the bank. The craft was farther upriver. With a swiftness I hardly believed myself capable of, I leaped from rock to rock. Gasping for breath, I slumped beside the canoe, pushed halfway up the sandy bank. A cry escaped my throat when I saw Iramamoe standing in front of me. Squatting, he opened his mouth and laughed. His laughter came in bursts, extending from his face to his feet. With such force, the ground shook beneath me. Tears ran down his cheeks, mingling with the blood from the gash between his brows. You forgot this, he said, dangling my knapsack in front of me. He opened it, then handed me my jeans and shirt. Today you will reach the mission. Is this the river on which the mission stands? I asked, staring at his blood-stained face. I don't recognize this place. You have been here with Angelica and Milagros, he assured me. The rains change the rivers and the forests the way the clouds change the sky. I pulled up my jeans. Loosely they hung from my waist threatening to slide over my hips. The damp, moldy-smelling shirt made me sneeze. I felt awkward and turned uncertain eyes to Iramamoe. How do I look? He walked around me, examining me meticulously from every angle. Then, after a moment's deliberation, he squatted once more and pronounced with a laugh, You look better painted with a noto. I squatted beside him. The wind was still. There was no movement on the river. Shadows from the tall trees reached across the river, darkening the sand at our feet. I wanted to apologize for smashing the gourd in his face and to explain my suspicions. I wanted him to tell me of the days in the mountains, but was reluctant to break the silence. As if cognizant and amused by my dilemma, Iramamoe lowered his face to his knees and laughed softly. As if sharing his mirth with the drops of blood falling between his widespread toes. I wanted to take the hikuras I once saw in your eyes, he murmured. He went on to say that not only he, but also Puriwariwe, the old Shapori, had seen the Hakuras within me. Every time I lay with you and felt the energy bursting inside you, I hoped to lure the spirits into my chest, Iramamoe said. But they didn't want to leave you. 
he turned his eyes to me, intense with protest. The Hakuras would not answer my call. They would not heed my songs. And then I became afraid that you might take the Hakuras from my body. Anger and an indescribable sadness rendered me speechless for a moment. Did we stay longer than a day and a night in the mountains? I finally asked, my curiosity getting the better of me. Iramamoe nodded, but did not say for how long we had remained in the hut. When I was certain that I could not change your body, when I realized that the Hakuras would not leave you, I carried you in a sling to this place. Had you changed my body, you would have kept me in the forest. Yuramamoe looked at me sheepishly. A smile of relief parted his lips, yet his eyes were veiled with a vague regret. You have the soul and shadow of an Itikoteri, he murmured. You have eaten the ashes of our dead, but your body and head is that of a nape. A silence punctuated his last sentence before he softly added, There will be nights when the wind will bring your voice mingled with the cries of monkeys and jaguars. And I will see your shadow dancing on the ground, painted by the moonlight. On those nights, I will think of you. He stood up and pushed the canoe into the water. Stay close to the bank, otherwise the current will take you too swiftly, he said, motioning me to climb inside. Aren't you coming? I asked, alarmed. It's a good canoe, he said, handing me a small paddle. It had a beautifully shaped handle, a rounded shaft, and the oval blade was shaped like a pointed concave shield. It will take you safely to the mission. Wait! I cried before he let go of the craft. My hands trembled as I fumbled with the zippered side pocket of my knapsack. I took out the leather pouch and handed it to him. Do you remember the stone the shaman Juan Caridad gave me? I asked. It's yours now. Something between shock and surprise seemed to momentarily paralyze his face. Slowly his fingers closed over the pouch and his features relaxed into a smile. Without a word, he pushed the canoe into the water. Folding his arms across his chest, he watched me drift downriver. I turned my head often until he was out of sight. There was a moment when I thought I still saw his figure, but it was only the wind playing with the shadows that tricked my eyes. Chapter 25 The trees on either side of the banks the clouds traveling across the sky shadowed the river. Hoping to shorten the time between the world left behind and the one now awaiting me, I paddled as fast as I could. But I soon got tired and then only used the small paddle to push myself free whenever I got too close to the bank. At times the river was clear reflecting the lush greenness with exaggerated intensity. There was something peaceful about the darkness of the forest and the deep silence around me. The trees seemed to be nodding in farewell as they bent slightly with the afternoon breeze. Or perhaps they were only lamenting the passing of the day, of the sun's last rays fading in the sky. Shortly before twilight deepened, I maneuvered the canoe toward the opposite bank, 
where I had seen stretches of sand amidst the dark rocks. As soon as the craft hit the sand, I jumped out and dragged the canoe farther up the bank, close to the forest edge, where drooping vines and branches formed a safe, dark nook. I turned around and gazed at the distant mountains, violet in the dusk, and I wondered if I had been up there for more than a week before Iramamoe carried me to the hut where I had awakened that morning. I climbed to the highest rock and scanned the landscape for the lights of the mission. It had to be farther than Iramamoe estimated, I thought. Only darkness crept from out of the river. Crawling up the rocks as the last vestiges of sunlight disappeared from the sky. I was hungry, but did not dare explore the sandy river shore for turtle eggs. I could not decide whether I should place my knapsack under my head as a pillow or wrap it around my cold feet as I lay inside the canoe. Through the tangled mass of branches above me, I saw the clear sky, filled with innumerable tiny stars shining like golden specks of dust. As I drifted off to sleep, my feet tucked in my knapsack, I hoped that my feelings, like the light of the stars spanning the sky, would reach those I had loved in the forest. I awoke shortly. The air was filled with the sounds of crickets and frogs. I sat up, then looked around me as if I could dispel the darkness. Shafts of moonlight spilled through the branches, painting the sand with grotesque shadows that seemed to come alive with the rustling of wind. Even with my eyes closed, I was painfully conscious of the shadows brushing against the canoe. And each time a cricket interrupted its continuous chirping, I opened my eyes, waiting for the sound to resume. Dawn finally silenced the cries, murmurs, and whistling of the forest. The mist-coated leaves looked as if they had been sprinkled with fine silver dust. The sun rose over the treetops, tinting the clouds orange, purple, and pink. I bathed, washed my clothes with the fine river sand, spread them over the canoe to dry, then painted myself with an otto. I was glad I had not arrived at the mission the day before, as I had first hoped, but that I still had time to watch the clouds change the sky. To the east, heavy clouds gathered, darkening the horizon. Lightning flashed in the distance. Thunder followed after long intervals and white lines of rain moved across the sky toward the north, keeping ahead of me. I wondered if alligators were basking in the sun amidst the driftwood scattered on the bank. I had not floated downriver for long before the waters widened. The current became so strong I had a hard time keeping from swirling around in the shallow waters along the bank beset with rocks. For an instant, I thought I was hallucinating. When I saw on the opposite bank a long dugout slowly pushing its way upriver, I stood up, frantically waving my shirt in the air, then cried with sheer happiness as the dugout crossed the wide expanse of water and headed toward me. With calculated precision, the almost 30-foot-long canoe beached just a few paces away. Smiling, 12 people climbed out of the canoe, four women, four men, and four children. They looked odd in their western clothes and the purple designs on their faces, 
Their hair was cut like mine, but the crown of their head was not shaved. Maquiritare? I asked. Nodding, the women bit their lips as if trying to contain their giggles. Their chins quivered until they burst into uncontrollable laughter that was echoed by the men. Hastily, I put on my jeans and shirt. The oldest woman came closer. She was short and sturdy, her sleeveless dress revealing round, fat arms and long breasts, which hung to her waist. You are the one who went into the forest with the old Itikoteri woman, she said, as if it were the most natural thing in the world to have found me paddling down river in a dugout made by her people. We know about you from the father at the mission. After formally shaking my hand, the old woman introduced me to her husband, their three daughters, their respective husbands and children. Are we close to the mission? I asked. We left early this morning, the old woman's husband said. We have been visiting relatives who live nearby. She has become a real savage, the youngest of the three daughters cried, pointing to my cut feet was such an expression of outrage that it was all I could do not to giggle. She searched my canoe and shook the empty knapsack. She has no shoes, she said in disbelief. She is a real savage. I looked at her bare feet. Our shoes are in the canoe, she affirmed, and proceeded to bring an assortment of footwear from the boat. See? We all have shoes. Do you have any food with you? I asked. We do, the old woman assured me, then asked her daughter to put the shoes back into the canoe and bring one of the bark boxes. The box was lined with platanilo leaves and filled with cassava bread. I huddled over the food, almost hugging it as I dunked piece after piece into a water-filled calabash before popping it into my mouth. My stomach is full and happy, I said after I had eaten halfway down the box. The Maquiritare regretted that they had no meat, but only sugarcane with them. The old man cut a foot-long piece, peeled the bamboo-like bark with his machete, then handed it to me. It will give you strength, he said. I chewed and sucked on the pale, hard fibers until they were dry and tasteless. The Maquiritare had heard about Milagros. One of the son-in-laws, one of the sons-in-law, knew him personally, but none of them knew where Milagros was. We will take you to the mission, the old man said. I made a feeble attempt to convince him that it was not necessary for him to retract, retrace his steps, but my words lacked conviction. Eagerly, I boarded the craft, sitting between the women and children. To take advantage of the full speed of the current, the men steered the canoe right into the middle of the river. They paddled without saying a word to each other. Yet each man was so attuned to the other's rhythm that they were able to anticipate each other's precise needs in advance. I remembered Milagros had once mentioned to me that the Maquiritare were not only the greatest boat builders of the Orinoco area, but also the best navigators. Exhaustion pressed heavily on my eyes. The rhythmic splashing of the paddles made me so drowsy, my head kept lolling forward and sideways. The bygone days and nights drifted through my mind like fragmented dreams of another time. It seemed all so vague, so far away, as if it had been an illusion. It was noon 
when I was awakened by Father Corri Corriolano, who had come into the room to bring me a mug filled with coffee. <clears throat> 18 hours of sleep is a good start, he said. His smile held the same reassuring warmth with which he had greeted me the day before as I stepped out of the Makriritare's boat. My eyes were still heavy with sleep as I sat on the canvas cot. My back was stiff from resting in a flat position. Slowly, I sipped the hot black brew. So strong and thickened with sugar, it made me nauseous. I also have chocolate, Father Coriolano said. I straightened the calico shift I had been given to sleep in and followed him into the kitchen. With the flair of a chef preparing a fancy meal, he stirred two tablespoons of dried milk powder, four of Nestle's chocolate powder, four of sugar, and a few grains of salt into a pot of water boiling on a kerosene stove. He drank my unfinished coffee while I spooned the delicious tasting chocolate. I can radio your friends in Caracas to pick you up with their plane anytime you want. Oh, not yet, I said faintly. The days passed slowly. In the mornings, I wandered around the gardens along the river bank. And at noon, I sat under the large mango tree that bore no fruit outside the chapel. Father Coriolano did not ask me what my plans were or how long I intended to stay at the mission. He seemed to have accepted my presence as something inevitable. In the evenings, I spent hours talking to Father Coriolano and to Mr. Barth, who often came to visit. We chatted about the crops, the school, the dispensary, always in personal subjects. I was grateful that neither of them asked me where I had been for over a year, what I had done, or what I had seen. I would not have been able to answer. Not because I wanted to be secretive, but because there was nothing to say. If we exhausted our conversation... Mr. Barth would read us articles from newspapers and magazines, some over 20 years old. Regardless of whether we were listening or not, he rattled on as he pleased, now and then interrupting himself to roar with laughter. In spite of their humor and affable nature, there were evenings when shadows of loneliness crossed their faces as we sat in silence listening to the rain pattering on the corrugated roof or to the solitary cry of a howler monkey settling for the night. It was then that I wondered if they too had learned the secrets of the forest, secrets of misty caves, of the sound of sap running through branches and trunks, of spiders spinning their silvery webs. At those times, I wondered if that was what Father Coriolano had tried to warn me about when he had talked of the dangers of the forest. And I wondered if it was this that kept them from returning to the world they had left behind. At night, enclosed in the four walls of my room, I felt a vast emptiness I missed the closeness of the huts, the smell of people and smoke. Carried by the sound of the river flowing outside my window, I dreamt I was with the Itikoteri. I heard Ritimi's laughter. I saw the children's smiling I saw the children's smiling faces. And there was also Iramamoe squatting outside his hut calling to the Hikuras that had eluded him. Walking along the river's edge one afternoon, I was overcome by an uncontrollable sadness. 
the noise of the river was loud, drowning out the voices of the people chatting nearby. It had rained at noon, and the sun peaked through the clouds without properly shining. Aimlessly, I walked up and down the sandy beach. Then in the distance I saw the lonely figure of a man approaching. Dressed in khaki pants and a red checkered shirt, he looked indistinguishable from any of the westernized Indians around the mission. Yet there was something familiar about the man's swaggering gait. Milagros! I cried, then waited until he stood before me. His face looked unfamiliar under the torn straw hat through which his hair stuck out like blackened palm fibers. I'm so glad you came. Smiling, he motioned me to squat beside him. He brushed his hand over the top of my head. Your hair has grown, he said. I knew you would not leave until you saw me. I'm going back to Los Angeles, I said. There have been so many things I wanted to ask him, but now that he was beside me, I no longer saw the need to have anything explained. We watched the twilight spread over the river and the forest. The darkness filled with the sounds of frogs and crickets. A full moon ascended the sky. It grew smaller as it climbed and covered the river with silver ripples. Like a dream, I murmured. A dream, Milagros repeated. A dream you will always dream. A dream of walking, of laughter, of sadness. There was a long pause before he continued. Even though your body has lost our smell, a part of you will always keep a bit of our world, he said, gesturing toward the distance. You will never be free. I didn't even thank them, I said. There is no thank you in your language. Neither is there goodbye, he added. Something cold like a drop of rain or dew, touched my forehead. When I turned to face him, Milagros was no longer by my side. From across the river, out of the distant darkness, the wind carried the Itikoteri's laughter. Goodbye is said with the eyes. The voice rustled through the ancient trees then vanished like the silvery ripples on the water. The End There is a glossary at the end here. Let me read it. See if I pronounce these words right. Ashukumaki A vine used to thicken Q-rare poison. Ayori toto, a vine used to poison fish. Apina, a hallucinatory snuff derived from either the bark of the apina tree or the seeds of the hisioma tree. Both substances are prepared and taken in the same fashion. Hekuras, tiny humanoid spirits that dwell in rocks and mountains. Shamans contact the Hikuras by taking the hallucinatory snuff, Apina. Through chants, the shamans lure the Hikuras into their chests. Successful shamans can control these spirits at will. Mamukori, a thick vine used to make the curare poison. Momo, a nut-like edible seed. Nabrushi, a six-foot-long... Nape, 
I pronounced it nape. A foreigner, anyone who is not an Indian, regardless of color, race, or nationality. Nape. Okoshiki, magical plants used for malevolent pur purposes. Onoto, a red vegetable dye derived from the crushed, boiled seeds of the Bixa orellana. The dye is used for decorating the face and body, as well as baskets, arrowheads, and ornaments. Pishahansi. I pronounced it Pishansi. A large leaf used for wrapping meat, for cooking, or as a receptacle. Platanillo. I pronounced it Platanillo. A large, broad, sturdy leaf used for wrapping and as a ground cover. Pohoro. Wild cacao. Rasha. The cultivated spiny trunked peach palm. Highly valued for its fruit which it produces for 50 years and longer. After the plantain, it is probably the most important lead plant in the gardens. These palms are owned individually by whoever planted them. Shabono, a permanent Yanomama settlement consisting of a circle of huts around an open clearing. Shapori, a shaman witch doctor, sorcerer. Sikau masik, a whitish edible mushroom that grows on decaying tree trunks. Unukai, a man who has killed an enemy. I know I pronounced that one wrong. Waiteri, a brave, courageous warrior. Pronounce that wrong too? Waiyamao. The formal, ritualized, ceremonial language used by the men when bartering. The official end.